Okay, everybody, it's time to worship. There's a lot of workers doing things this morning. We welcome you in the name of Jesus. We are so glad that you are here today. You are a blessing, and we honor God in our congregation. So we praise him, and we thank him for this beautiful weather. I've been praying for a light rain, not a heavy rain, so my sign doesn't get destroyed. Isn't that awful? I... You know, but I've learned that God wants us in every part of our lives, so I'm praying for it. So here we go. What a day. What a day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in him. And we know wherever two or more are gathered in his name, he is with us today. So welcome. We are so honored today to have Carol Carter as our pastor giving the message today. And it's a busy day with Charge Conference right after the service, so don't get up and leave. I'm sure Carol will help us on that one to remind you at the end. And we also have dressing, we're making dressing, and Linda's got her big stick ready to go and keep us in line. Um, so with that, if you look at the back of your bulletin, there are the announcements. I just want to um, let Janet say whatever she needs to say about the turkey dinner. This is going to be a busy week, but isn't it fun to serve the Lord? You know, I know sometimes you dread thinking, oh, but it's joy because we get to serve the community and let them see the love of Christ come through us. So, Miss Janet, do you want to, I know you want to say some things, even if we don't know what to say. Well, um, it looks like we wound up with about 60 turkey breasts. So I don't know if it's taking place of maybe less turkeys. You'd have to check with Ron. So uh, turkey breasts are easy to cook. So you know, don't take as long, and they're not as heavy, but if you could possibly do a turkey breast also would be great. Uh, I think I think we're on track. Um, also, we'll be setting up the tables and stuff in the gym for everything today. Um, I will need a little help, I think, Tuesday, because I'm going to put the jello in the cups. We can sit at the table, so it's not like you have to stand up and take care of that. But if you would like to help do that Tuesday morning about 10 or 10.30, and then we can just get them done and prepared ahead of time. So I think, I think everything's good. We'll just wait and see what happens, I guess. <laughs> so far, we're as organized as we can be until the actual event. So, uh, and I appreciate everybody's help. Thank you for everything. It, uh, it's a big help, and we appreciate it. Thanks. One quick thing, pie cutting. Um, they're, they're going to be cutting pies. I know Catherine has a team to cut pies at 9 o'clock, isn't it, I think? 9.30 or so on Wednesday morning. So that means the pies need to get here. You want them here on Tuesday? Or just bring them early on Wednesday morning. And uh, yeah, even a continuous thing. But we need to get those cut and ahead of time. So if you can come at 9 30, 10 o'clock, I'll be here too. We, we need to cut them all. And that's, you know, we can't be hesitating because if I just have a vision that we're just going to have so many, we just got to keep moving. So we have to have things done so we can get them out the door to our people. And we'll praise the Lord for that because I know that's going to happen. So with that, announcement. Um, we're ready to do the dressing. I've got everything set out. Um, if you haven't signed up to help, that doesn't matter. I'll see you in the kitchen after charge conference. And I will tell how many we need. Everybody just remember to wash your hands before we start. Amen. For sure. Also, 
you know, it's an honor today to have Dion and Rick here. Um, Tiny's kids, I should say. I think both of them were kids. I think Rick was adopted <laughs> when Dion got him into the family. So, but what a celebration yesterday. One thing that Bev was telling me, and, and I think this is really important, her great-grandmother, it would have been Tiny's mother, tatted our uh, communion uh, cover. And what a gift. I get goosebumps thinking about that because, you know, that's, a, that's actually a talent that we're losing. Um, and we need to learn. But I'm like Dion. I didn't learn how to crochet and do those things my grandmother were, was doing all the time. And I regret that. But anyway, it was a wonderful celebration. And we loved your mother. We loved your family. I, I was really excited when I saw your dad's picture. I go, I remember Bob. <laughs> so it was cool to see that. Um, also, I, just one last thing. George's memorial um, and service will be on Friday, November 5th at 1 at um, our church. So please put that on your calendar. What an honor to be able to celebrate George's life, who did so much for us. And with that, we uh, did I miss anything? I have to always clarify with Clarence and Bev because they keep me in line. Good? Our opening song today is What a Mighty God We Serve Medley. And this was one we've done before with the video when Gary was here. So enjoy and sing it in your head or sing it out. And praise God for being here today.
Amen. Please stand for our call to worship, if you can. Happy are those who help is in the God of Jacob. Who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord lifts up all those who are bowed down. Amen. If you'll stay standing for our next hymn, it's God of grace and God of glory. Yes, he is. for our joys and concerns. It's a joy that, Jesse, you did great in your run the other day at District. We're proud of you. You better, bettered your time, didn't you? Well, that's all right. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. Yes, and I know Aaron got to go to state, and I never did really hear what they did, but I think... You know, it doesn't matter because they went to state. That's the important thing. Amen. But the Twin Falls girls won the state tournament. Oh, woohoo. Yeah, they played very well. So, with that, what joys do you have and concerns, please? I have a joy. Woohoo! Brian Bartlett, that we have been praying for, that's been on our prayer list, is out of the hospital. Yay. Twice they thought he had only hours left, and he has recovered, and we give God all the praise and glory. Praise God. Yes. Amen. My friend had had back surgery, and she's had a lot of challenges, and she had to postpone her back surgery, even though the doctor thought if she didn't get in and have surgery, she would be paralyzed. And so they've had to wait. But good news is she wasn't paralyzed. But when they took her in, she had, they thought, a slight stroke. We were all just, ugh. So the prayers went out, and guess what? She's fine now, talking, and will be in rehab for her back, so it's taken care of. God is so good. Thank you. It was Jill Chestnut, if some of you knew Jill, from Twin Falls. So, any others? Okay, come on. Well, of course, we lift up the families that have lost their loved ones, but we know the good news is when they know the Lord, we know where they're at, and they're having a glorious time reuniting with family and friends that knew the Lord also. So, and again, we're thankful. We're thankful for all of those individuals that have served the Lord well and we've gotten to know. Seeing none, there's, of course, always the prayer list on the back, so remember that. 
And always remember, too, sometimes we get carried away with the negative things, but God is with us in everything we go through or everything that happens, so we want to praise him for that. So with that, let's pray. Father God, you are so good to us, and we praise you, and we thank you for your glory. We thank you for being with us in everything we do. We thank you for helping us to be comforted and given the strength to get through the things we need to do each and every day. We thank you for those that have come before us that have served you well over generations and generations, that have guided all of us to know you better. We thank you for Carol being here today to preach her message for all those that work behind the scenes and for this turkey dinner that we hope will honor and glorify you and will help our community know that this is a place they are welcome, no matter what denomination. We thank you for our families and the time that as the holidays get closer, the main holiday that we should celebrate is your birth, Jesus for everything that you've done for us, and of course, the death on the cross that cleansed us from our sins, that saved us, that gives us hope each and every day. We thank you for our military and for our leaders, and we ask that you continue to guide them and give them your wisdom. You are our Father, almighty, sovereign God, and we thank you for this creation and for this church. We ask for continued blessings on all that we do, that it may always be for your glory and not our own. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, and I always, sorry God, I always forget this one. Please join me in the disciples that were taught to pray by Jesus saying, our Father, who art Now, for our famous pianist, she's going to play praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 17, and Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. May the Lord open our hearts and minds to his reading. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You asked, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, Listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in the dust and ashes to show my repentance. Continuing on with verse 10. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all his brothers, sisters, and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against them. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jeremiah, the second Kiza, and the third Karen Hoth. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. And then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. Continuing on with Mark. Then they reached Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartismus, son of Timus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartismus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he is calling you. Bartissimus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go. For your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. May the Lord add his blessing to my reading. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Carol, Pastor Carol in the old days. Now I'm so retired, no one calls me that. But I'm happy to have the opportunity to be with you and share some thoughts on scripture with you this morning. 
As I was preparing, I was aware that in some of the churches in our area, uh, the sermons have been following the story of Job from beginning and now to the very end. And so I chose the Job reading because uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of comfort and hope in the end of this story, if not in the middle or the beginning. Uh, Job has, has had so many troubles. Well, I think we can relate to that. We've had so many troubles, have we not, for the last two years? Hasn't it been crazy? Hasn't it been difficult? Hasn't there been lots, too much sorrow, too much death, too much fear, too much hatred, too much of a lot of things that we really don't want to have in our life. So I stand here with you as one who has been battered by just the time that we live in right now, in this country, in our churches in Idaho, uh, I do, I am a foreigner, I come from California, but uh, I have been delighted to move here and be near my daughter and her grands, my grandson who's 16. Um, that is the reason we left uh, our home in California and moved to Gooding. So I'm happy to be among you. And I have, you know, arrived uh, at the beginning on January the 3rd, 2020, just in time for COVID. Uh, to bring all of us uh, tremendous suffering and challenge in our life together as well as our life in our families and in our nation. So it's been a time of turmoil. And I I'm thinking that Job understood what it was like to live in a time like ours, even though he li lived ancient times, that the story is about a man who had troubles and complained bitterly about his troubles, but he also had a strong relationship to God. And so he had confidence in God that he was not being punished, but that he was just going through hard times, which happen to all human beings, don't they? So he kept telling his friends, his friends said, oh, you did something terrible. You know this story, I think. And, uh, he said, no, I didn't. I didn't sin. Oh, you must have sinned for all these bad things to happen to you. Well, you know, that's not the source of the difficulties we have in our life. Usually, sometimes we make mistakes, of course, and it makes our life even more difficult sometimes. But um, I, I love that at the end of the story, um, it says that Job lived 140 years after this time of trouble, 140 years, and saw four generations of his family. Now, I suspect the writer has a gift for exaggeration. Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, there are some beautiful moments in that last passage in chapter 42, when he mentions that he had uh, sons and daughters, a lot of sons, but three daughters, and the, they're named. How often in scripture are the women named? It's very unusual. And not only that, the women receive inheritance of property. That never happened in those times. It's astonishing to see it in the text that somehow Job had it in his heart to treat his daughters as well as his sons. Very unusual, something from God, I think. Uh, so uh, I can understand uh, it looks a bit like a fairy tale. <laughs> you know, did that really happen? Well, what I believe about the text is that uh, it tells our story. It tells our story of suffering and difficulty, and that many times it is not caused by our sin, but by our humanity. <laughs> we have human failings. We bump into each other awkwardly and cause harm. Sometimes we intend it, sometimes we do not. But that God, God is greater than all that we can imagine. And his love for humanity is endless. And that his love for the creation never stops. And so here's Job standing at the end of his life, a very old man, full of years and full of life to the very end. We can only hope that our lives will be like that. 
Well, the other text for today is from Mark, a very different kind of text, except that there's still suffering in it. There's a man who has become blind, and his name is Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus is reduced to being a beggar. He's no longer uh, a citizen of the community, a part of the family, uh, a part of all that goes on. He's sidelined almost completely by his blindness, long before the days of uh, uh, government making uh, laws about caring for people who are disabled in any way. So Bartimaeus is just on the outside of the community as soon as he becomes blind. No one knows how to communicate with him and he with them. And so all he can do to stay alive is to beg on the side of the road. Uh, and yet he hears that Jesus is coming. He must have heard more than one thing about Jesus because he seems very excited. <clears throat> In fact, he's downright embarrassing to the people around who say, when he shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they tell him, they scold him. They say, be quiet, don't bother the master. Um, so it's a wonderful story that this Bartimaeus has courage. He has confidence in Jesus. He's heard that he's a man of God. He understands that this person has healing power, God's healing power. And whatever it is that he wants, Jesus doesn't know, but he's so wise to ask, what is it you want me to do for you? I think today in our church, we could use that question a lot more effectively in our communities because uh, we ask that to one another. We care for one another in beautiful ways, but I wonder if we might not experiment with asking that question beyond the doors of the church. What would you like us to do for you? That would be an interesting conversation. No matter this church or another, I think that is uh, maybe a wave of the future. So there's suffering in these texts, in the Job text and in the Mark text, and there's healing and restoration also. So there's hope in these stories. I want to tell you about hope, an image I have of it. Hope when it seems like there might not be a lot of it. And I can sense already being here this morning that when you decided to build this church, you had a lot of hope because it's beautiful. And you planned for lots of people and you had great ideas of the programs you could have and how people could hear about Jesus and have their lives transformed by his love. And I know you carry those hopes and dreams in your heart today or you would not keep showing up. So that's a wonderful gift that you have. Well, I heard a rather old pastor preach when I was just a kid. And he was talking about hope and how it is to have hope in Christ. <clears throat> He said it's like when human beings decide to build a bridge. In particular, he was talking about the Golden Gate Bridge. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but I know you've seen pictures. And the way it was built back in the day when it was built was that they first created a deep, strong foundation on either side, one on up in Marin County, that's on the north side of the bay, and then another strong foundation on the San Francisco side. And then they, they uh, had to figure out a cable system. This bridge was going to be held up by cables because it wasn't any way. The ocean is really deep uh, going in from the ocean into the bay. Uh, and so they uh, had a system of cables that they invented and ways to hold the cables up. And the last thing they did was they sent workers out there, they built the roadway on the land, and then they moved the roadway out over nothing. They pushed it across that big space between the two uh, places until it went all the way across. People had to be on that bridge out over nothing. 
And I think that's how Job felt. He was out over nothing. He could not understand his suffering. And I think that's how Mark was too. That, and and uh, how it was for Bartimaeus in the Gospel of Mark, that as a blind person, he was out over nothing. I mean, what kind of life could he have, really? And there are those, often found, I, I believe, in churches, who have a faith and a hope and a confidence in God's love. They're willing, even though they can't see what's going to happen in the future, to go out into that space over what looks like nothing, but is truly everything to us which is the love of God that sustains us and carries us, and to trust the Holy Spirit to design the bridge, not just the bridge between two pieces of land, but the bridge between ourselves and our God, and the bridge between us as human beings who are not meant to uh, hate one another or to hurt one another, to harm one another, but to care for one another and to share the love of Christ uh, widely to the whole world. And so I love the church because it does that. And even now when it, I, I look in Idaho and I see churches for sale, I see churches very empty compared to in the past, and I wonder what is the future of the church here in this state? But I trust that you are the kind of people who are not afraid to get on board with whatever the Holy Spirit is doing and go out over nothing to stand on God's promises, not to stand on your accomplishments or the, the acts of the past, but to stand on your confidence in the Holy Spirit to do a new thing. From the beginning to the end of scripture, God is always saying, behold, that means look, see it. I'm doing something new. I'm doing a new thing. From one end of scripture, to, from the creation to the book of Revelation, behold, I am doing a new thing. So I invite us today, while we're having a little rest before making dressing, turkey, gravy, all that stuff that is going to be so good to share, I'm glad we have a couple of moments just to rest in God's love, to rest in the power of the Holy Spirit, to rest in confidence that the Holy Spirit has a design a design for life, for goodness. That's why Jeremiah showed up at the top of your bulletin. I actually want to read you that little tiny bit of Jeremiah. Sometimes you just need a prophet to pop in. <laughs> so, scripture, other scriptures aside, the prophet Jeremiah lived in a t terrible time for his people. And when he was called to be a prophet, God spoke to him about tearing down and building up to plant, to destroy, uh, contrasting kinds of words that would be a part of the people of God of his time. But Jeremiah decided after his nation and Jerusalem had been invaded uh, and the leaders, all the up and coming leaders of the community exiled to Babylon, he wrote a letter to the exiles, and he said, God has sent you into exile. It will be 70 years of exile. You're not going back right away. But eventually, God will bring you home. And his words were, uh, I think, just the right words for us to listen to today. Uh, just a tiny verse, verse 11, in chapter 29 of Jeremiah. For surely you know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. I kept hearing Jeremiah say that in my ear the whole time I was getting ready for this sermon today. And I thought, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to say. That out over nothing not standing on what has been in the past. I don't believe the church in the future will be anything like it was before. It will be new, God's new creation, and we will be made new as a part of it. And I don't think we can even imagine what that will look like. Is that right? 
Anybody got a picture yet? <laughs> I, I just think we don't know, and it's all right not to know because we're standing on the promises of God, the promise also that Jeremiah spoke to his people. We don't know the future, but we know God will care for us. God has invested everything in this amazing creation, including we human beings and all the other creatures of the earth. So I believe we can trust that God of love to carry us out over what looks like nothing into the future that God has planned for these human beings to have. So I uh, admire you for today planning a turkey dinner. I don't think you had one last year, did you? Wasn't it impossible last year because of COVID? We were hiding in our homes most of the time, not really hiding, but it felt like that, and isolated from one another, even more than we still are. <clears throat> but this year, you decided to do the turkey dinner. Wow, what an act of hope and faith. If you ask me, you're going to be exhausted. Maybe you already are just thinking about it. <laughs> but on the other hand, this whole community will receive the blessing of that delicious turkey dinner. And I'm told the dressing is so good that they'll come back for more, maybe Christmas time. <laughs> so I thank God for you. I thank God for the faith that has nourished in you from probably many years long ago. Or maybe you just discovered it recently. Who knows? But I believe that your faith and your love flowing from the heart of God, flowing from Christ our Savior, that you will be moving along and building that new church right out over nothing. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much. What a message, huh? Thank you, Carol, so much. God is a blessing to all of us, and he does give us that hope. Time for offering. You remember our treasure box is back there. So with that, let's stand for our, our doxology. <laughs> pray. O oh, Father of hope and goodness, of grace and mercy, we thank you for all the resources you have blessed us with, and for this church and for Carol's message, for your word that gives us life and gives us hope for eternity. Thank you, Lord. We ask for the blessings to be honored by you, and to let us know what to do with them. We thank you for everything, and we ask for continued guidance and wisdom to do your will and not ours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our song, our final song, if you'll remain standing, all hail the power of Jesus' name.
are going to uh, have a benediction, a blessing for us right now, and sit down right where we are and have our charge conference. It will not take a long, long time, but there are important things to do. And I invite you all to please stay and be a part of that conference after our benediction. <laughs> I, are you putting one up? Oh, all right. Holy God, we ask you to now to bless all of us as we uh, gather for this important meeting of this congregation. We ask you to bless the Crossroads Church as you have in the past and even more so in the future. Help us to make wise decisions today and to be guided by your love and your Holy Spirit in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.